Um, so I want to open it up for questions, but before I do, I just want to give you um, just a few little anecdotes, which I think are always fun to talk about. Um, first of all, for those of you who don't know, we actually premiered this film at the Sundance Film Festival in January. We were one of 16 films in the U.S. documentary competition. Uh, I think there were 842 that uh, applied that year for that category, so we were pretty fortunate. And, um, and then we were the only documentary that was bought by HBO um, at Sundance this year, and we premiered on June 27th, and we uh, were shown, I think, 32 times or something on HBO this summer. We were on, a, on demand. I think you might still be able to get it on HBO Go, but it's off, it's off to band at this point. But DVDs come out November 1st, and you can put it on your Netflix queue. And uh, I'm also going to be on Colbert on October 25th. So if you have that, you can watch me on that. <laughs> Um, so I always, I always tell this story when I first started, and, I, and excuse me to the torch class I was in earlier, because I, I already told this story, so you'll be hearing this again, but maybe it'll have a different meaning for you now. So when I got the call the Monday before Thanksgiving uh, of last year that we were accepted into Sundance, the, um, the programmer who called me said, uh, congratulations, Susan, we're really thrilled, and of course I was screaming and crying and all those things. And he said, but you do know that everyone in the office is checking their employment contracts to see if we have an arbitration clause. And he said, and we do. And I said, well, the ironic part is that I had to sign one to get into this festival. And I didn't want to, you know, it's online, it was an online, um, anything you buy online, you know, it says go through this and you have to submit and you have to put, push I accept, well, whoever reads those, okay? And it was, and I called my, one of my producers and I said, I'm not gonna wanna sign this. And she said, oh, just sign the damn thing, you know? So, you know, you don't have a choice in these matters. Um, so I'd love to open it up for questions. Um, of course, I've got lots of stories and I have some, some uh, new people have come into the room. Uh, I think there's some, some lawyers, and in fact, uh, my nice, good friend Adam Malone just walked in. Hey, Adam, is a big supporter of the film, and, uh, and Adam actually um, was the lawyer who challenged the cap here in Georgia. Uh, you used to have a cap, and it was found unconstitutional, and that's the man right there who got it found unconstitutional. <laughs> so, questions? So just, just so you know, I mean, I was, I was a lawyer before I did this. You know, I, I, I made this movie, as I said earlier, just because it had to be made. Somebody had to, like, get this information out. And it's my, it's my uh, truth. And uh, I tell people all the time, if you're going to be a juror, and I don't know, I mean, I'm, I also talked to this in the torts class. Did you notice how the film it was sort of like you were in a lawyer's office? You know, there was, a, there was a litigation box at the beginning, it had the file folders in it, and then each one of the exhibits for the case was like a file folder that would be in a law office, and then there were the highlighting and all that. That was because I'm a lawyer, you know? <laughs> and, and that's what I would do when I would, when I would prepare for trial. And, uh, and so I, I made this film as if I were trying a case. And, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, I'm not trying to change your minds with this film. I just want to open your minds that there is another point of view on this topic. Most people say, well, you only tell one side of the story. And I'm like, well, don't you know the other side already? You don't know this side. You only know the other side. And so if you're going to be a jury, and if I'm going to try a case to you and I'm going to ask you to render a fair verdict, I want you to know both sides of the issue before you rule. And so I'm asking the American public to at least know this side of the issue so the next time they vote, you know, Rick Perry's made tort reform one of his top four items in the election. How many people know what a tort is, let alone know what tort reform is? How many people here before you saw this movie really understood what tort reform was? You know, and I mean, I was in Houston two weeks ago in a uh, Houston law school, and they didn't have any idea what tort reform was. Nobody knows what a tort is. I was telling the uh, students, uh, my original name of the movie before Hot Coffee was Distorted, Distorted, Has Justice Been Sold? And then I realized nobody knows what a tort is, so no one's going to get the joke, right? <laughs> so anyway, questions? I saw one back here. Yes. You're welcome. I think there's a mic right there if you want to use it. Um, so thank you for coming out and talking to us today. And my question was going to be, uh, what kind of people have been coming forward now that the movie is out, and what kind of re reception have you been getting? Yeah, thanks for asking that. So, um, well, first of all, when we premiered at Sundance, you know, it's all a Hollywood press there. It's all about movie making. So the first people who reviewed this film was like the Hollywood Reporter, Variety, you know, Movie Phone, and all these, you know, and they loved it. I was just, you know, like entertaining 
was the first word that the Hollywood Reporter said. I mean, I made a movie about tort reform, and they said entertaining. That's, that's pretty good, don't you think? And, um, and you know, I couldn't get very many people to help me finance this movie because nobody understood what the movie was about. Like, no matter how much I would tell people, even people who understood, like, the legal issues, they just didn't get it for the most part. So it was very difficult to get. I, I financed this movie literally person by person, house party by house party. Um, but the reviews, both the political press and the Hollywood press, have been extremely positive. The only people who don't like it are the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, and uh, also, I've been getting the first, um, when this premiered on HBO on June 27th, we got 100,000 hits to our website that, that week. Um, our website is hotcoffeethemovie.com, and there's a trailer on there. And then we also have these action items. So we had in all, the version of the film that was at all the film festivals. We've been to probably 25 film festivals around the country. And also, um, it's now airing in Israel, on, on, on TV right now in Israel. It's going to be uh, translated into Portuguese. It's going to the Rio de Janeiro Film Festival next week. It's been in Canada. It's been in um, New Zealand. Um, and it's been all over this country, of course. And, and, um, and um, what was I going to say about that? Hold on. Um, so, so the reviews have been, have been phenomenal. We've won many awards. We won the Grand Jury Award in Seattle. But I, I said, well, since we have coffee in our name, it's probably was one of the reasons. But we also won the Grand Jury Award in Tampa at uh, the Traverse City Film Festival, which is Michael Moore's film festival. We won the award for the documentary that every American should see. Um, but our, our Facebook page, which is um, facebook.com slash hotcoffeethemovie, um, we have uh, over, um, like, over 6,000 fans at this point, and people write to us all the time saying, this was you know, eye-opening. I thought I was an informed consumer. I was always one of those people who made fun of the McDonald's case, and I will never do it again. You know, I was a big supporter of tort reform, and I will never do it again. I mean, people are really like, responding. The other thing that's happening is when, tr when lawyers try cases, um, they have to pick a jury. And most of the time, if it's a personal injury case, there's always a question about, well, what do you think about lawsuits? And people always raise their hand and say, oh, well, there's too many frivolous lawsuits. And, uh, you know, that's like that McDonald's case. But now I'm getting emails saying that the other jurors are saying, no, 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 you got it wrong. You got to go see that movie Hot Coffee. So that's pretty great. I also heard that Harry Reid mentioned the film in a conference call uh, two weeks ago to, I don't know who was on the call exactly, someone mentioned who was on the call, and said that he said, well, if you don't understand what's really happening, you need to go see that movie Hot Coffee. Um, I also anecdotally heard that Carl Rove was asked if he watched the movie, and he said, no, I don't want to watch that movie, but I read the transcript. I'm thinking, transcript? Who did a transcript for him, right? And someone said, because he had referenced in this speech that, you know, we, need, we still need tort reform because a woman can spill coffee and get $2.9 million. And the, the person who went up and questioned him was, is also as a constitutional law professor. Um, and he said, well, did you see that movie Hot Coffee? And that's when he said that. And he said, but, you know, you know you have the facts wrong. Like, she didn't get $2.9 million. And he says, well, that's what the jury gave. He says, yeah, but she wasn't driving, and you're sort of implying that she was driving. She wasn't even in a, in a moving car. And he, he, according to this person, he said, I don't really care what the facts are. You know. And so it's still being, you know, touted as, you know, the example of tort reform. Let me ask you guys a question. Honestly, before you walked in the door today, how many people have heard of this case, the McDonald's coffee case? And how many people thought it was a frivolous or ridiculous lawsuit? And how many people think that now? That, what you just, I mean, you might be afraid to say it or something, but I'll tell you, what, what you just happened just now has been happening all over this country, you know, in every uh, Q&A that I go to. Because you didn't know what the facts were, but you thought you did, right? Everybody thought it was. I mean, did you, did you see Jane Pauley at the beginning of the film say it was a very opening thing? You may have missed it. She was substituting for Tom Brokaw on the NBC Nightly News when the verdict came out. And she reported that this woman got this verdict while driving the car, that she spilled the coffee while driving. You know, this is the media. It's not like the true facts didn't come out. The Wall Street Journal, of all places, actually did a very comprehensive, true account of this uh, a case. But the media didn't pick up on that. They didn't, they didn't repeat that. They just repeated the false stuff, the funny stuff. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, in the back. Yes, thank you for asking that. Um, so on our website, we have a take action page. 
because people want to know. I hope that you are fired up. I mean, I actually was on a panel last week. Ralph Nader was on the panel, and he said to, the, to law students, this was in Washington, DC, he says, if you're, if you're not angry right this minute, you should probably not be here. You know, if you don't have fire in your belly after watching a film like this and feel like, oh my god, we have to do something, you might be in the wrong profession. Because we, you, I don't want, I, look, I made this film to get the word out, to educate people. But I'm passing the baton to you and to every single person who sees this film to take it to the next level, to make sure that we actually do something, that we take action. Unfortunately, the take action items that were in the film for all the film festival version, HBO wouldn't put in, on their, uh, in their version because they thought they were too political. But they're on our website and they'll be on extra on our DVD. So, but go to our website um, and look at the take action items. I want to talk to you just about a second about arbitration clauses because I, I think it's important because that's really the one that's going to affect you most. Hopefully, you'll never need you know, to file a lawsuit and caps on damages, I hope, never become part of your life. Um, but mandatory arbitration clauses are part of your life right now because every single contract that you're being asked to sign and even those that you're not being asked to sign have these clauses in them now. And so this is the one that affects you the most. So what can you do? The first thing is, is that there's nothing wrong with voluntary arbitration. I want to make a distinction between forced mandatory arbitration and voluntary arbitration. These clauses that, that are in this film are clauses that you're being asked to sign before you ever know that you're going to have a dispute with the company. Right? So you sign them, you never even think about it, you don't read them, and then you have a dispute with this company. And then the company that you now have this dispute with picks the decision maker, pays for the decision maker. The decision maker doesn't have to give a reason why he or she comes up with the decision. It's completely secretive and there's no right to appeal. That's what, that's what I have a problem with. But let's say you have a dispute with a company and then after the dispute, you both sides decide that you want to come out of the system, out of the litigation, this kind of system, the court system, and go into a voluntary arbitration process where you both get to pick the decision maker. You know, sometimes what happens is, is that each side picks one and then the two arbitrators pick a third. And you pay equally for the arbitration and you have rules that you come up with. There's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly fine. So I want to make sure that there's a distinction. Now, in these clauses, in these, many times you're not going to have a choice. But sometimes you do. I just put my house up on the market. And I picked a realtor that had, and my realtor had these, one of these mandatory arbitration clauses. And I said, I'm really sorry, but I'm not going to sign this. So we either take this clause out or I go to get a different realtor. And so it came out. And that's true with, with you will have some choices in contracts. And also, many times, just cross it out and put your initials next to it. The person who's giving it to you has no idea what it is either. You know, I have to tell you, though, that the other day I was taking a hike. I live in Oregon, and I, I was hiking, and I bumped into this doctor who I know. And he said, he says, oh, I really loved your movie. He says, and I'm going to start putting those mandatory arbitration clauses in my contracts. And I was like, oh, no, that is not the point. <laughs> I do have this friend in Chicago. He's a lawyer, and he said when he's forced to sign these things, instead of signing his name, he writes no effing way. <laughs> but the, what we really do need is we need legislation. And there is legislation pending in both the House and the Senate. Senator Franken actually introduced uh, a bill. This was in the last Congress, but it never went anywhere. It's called the Arbitration Fairness Act. And, but, but Senator Franken reintroduced it after the Concepcion case, the AT&T versus Concepcion case, which is a Supreme Court case that allows corporations to now ban class actions in our contracts. So Senator Franken introduced it in the Senate, and um, Bruce Braley, who's the congressman from Iowa that you see in, in the film, he's the one cross-examining the woman from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, um, he introduced it in the House. And what that uh, bill will do was, will be to prevent these kinds of clauses from being in all of our contracts. So call your congressman, call your senator, and, and say support the Arbitration Fairness Act. And the other thing I really want, hope that you guys will do is, when the DVD comes out, have a house party. Tell your friends about it. Students need, every student in this country needs to see that, oh, I hope every student would like to see this film or that you'd like people to see this film so that you know what your rights are. Other questions? In the back. Yeah, so, um, you know, just because you get a right to trial doesn't mean the right thing always happens. She, um, the, the, the defense was consensual sex and uh, she lost her case. 
She was unable to present much of the evidence that you see in this film. Of course, she didn't have a lot of the evidence because it had been destroyed. So I can't, I can't really comment too much on it. I wasn't there. Um, I am so grateful to Jamie Lee Jones for fighting uh, to get mandatory arbitration out of these government contract clauses. And I personally don't think she would have fought all these years if it didn't happen, of course. Um, but just because you have the right facts doesn't mean you're going to win necessarily. And so that, that's pretty sad. She's appealing her case. And just the other thing is Halliburton's the largest employer in Houston, and it was a Houston federal court. You want to use the mic? Yeah, sorry. This changes <laughs> the focus hand. a little bit, but I would deduce from watching the film and the, the section on um, Justice Diaz that you, or Diaz, mm -hmm. that, uh, that your viewpoint would be that um, running for election as a judge is not a good option because of the way the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and other business interests can affect the election. Is that fair, and do you think that appointed yeah, positions so, would so be a better I, option? Um, I don't think that one's, that, that's such a great idea either. So this is, this is um, uh, and I, I'm actually starting another movie soon, and I'm going to be dealing with uh, these issues as well. I'm gonna, uh, my next film has a working title of Citizens Unite, and I'm going to be following uh, a judicial race, a congressional race, and the presidential race, and show how the Citizens United case and special interest money is affecting uh, each branch of our government. But um, what I think is, I think that there's, um, um, I think that electing judges is really fraught with peril for the reasons that you saw here. I mean, if you're going to run, in, and in some states you run as a Republican or a Democrat. You know, we're, we're not supposed to be Republican, Democrat, or I mean, we're supposed to be completely neutral when we are sitting as a judge. We're supposed to be above politics and be guardians of the law. And if you're running for office and you're raising money, you are beholden to somebody. There's a system that I'm aware of, which is the one that I think is, works the, the best, that I is where um, there's a, a, the governor appoints a committee of uh, community members that has like lawyers, uh, lawyers and um, business people and citizens, and they um, uh, evaluate all the applications and then and interview the potential people, and then they make a recommendation to the governor, like three people who are recommended from this committee, and then the governor picks one person, and then there's also a checks and balance even after that. So that's the system that I think sounds like it's the fairest, but um, in my, as I'm investigating this next film, I'm actually going to do an analysis of, of what other systems exist, and then I'll put them out there and then people can see. Uh, but I, I, I think that a governor picking is just the same as, as, uh, as a running for office, because the governor is beholden to someone and he's going to, just like we do our Supreme Court. I mean, is our Supreme Court really fair and neutral at this point? Are they really? Unbiased? I mean, clearly not because of the way they're they're appointed. So, thank you. Yeah. Schedule here. We scheduled this this time of night because we were hoping to draw also from the bar to come. And we know that your blood sugar is getting lower and our blood sugar is getting lower. But let me give you just a quick thing. We also have some very good distinguished folks that are going to come up and talk to us. But we're going to limit that to a half an hour. And then we want to invite you in the in for a reception so that you can continue conversations with Susan. But if we could have our panelists come up and let me introduce to you Reuben Gutman. Uh, Reuben Gutman is one of Emory's star lawyers. Reuben is a one of the preeminent whistleblower lawyers in the country. He has been a terrific supporter of our law school. He teaches in our trial techniques program. He also uh, has accompanied us to Mexico. He's been a, a supporter in a lot of wonderful ways. And Ruben is going to help us and moderate the panel. So Ruben, if you would come on up to the microphone. Well, actually, thank you, Paul. I do these things so we can have the videotape sent to my mother, who always appreciates this, because she wants to know whether I've ever accomplished anything. Uh, so um, as the panelists are, are coming up here, let me introduce them quickly. Of course, we have Susan, Adam Malone, who's a prominent trial lawyer, plaintiff side trial lawyer uh, in Atlanta. Professor Vandal, who is uh, one of the preeminent, obviously, as you know, experts on the tort system, the civil tort system. 
Uh, we have Professor Rubin from Emory University, who's an economics professor and who is uh, a star of Susan's movie. And Chris Hall, whom some of you had the opportunity to meet last night, is a trial lawyer in Atlanta, uh, goes to court, and actually has secured some verdicts. So let me sort of open it up by throwing it out to Professor Rubin. Uh, rumor has it that you're a big fan of this movie, so I want you to tell us why. Thank you. I hadn't seen the movie. Uh, didn't know I was in it until I, I just heard from, from you. Uh, so it's my first movie role, and I'm waiting for contracts. Um, it was a very, very well done movie. It was a, a, a brilliant piece of propaganda. I thought it was quite interesting that, you know, a good bit of the movie was attacking the propaganda from the tort reform people with what is itself a very, very strong propaganda movie. I'm not a lawyer, but I hang around them a lot, and I've worked on a lot of legal cases. And one thing I've observed is that when you read one side's briefs, you say, well, they've got the perfect case. And then you read the other side's briefs, and you say, gee, they have the perfect case. So here we had four stories told from one side only. Um, I, I don't know those cases very well, so I don't know them. But we, I do know that this was a one-sided, as, as the movie was, a one-sided presentation of the cases. It was interesting in the Q&A, we learned that the young lady at the end lost her case when she did get the right to go to court, which says something about uh, how strong the case may have been. But again, I don't know any more about the cases than was in the movie. Um, the story about the judge, well, it's true that businesses are spending money on electing judges, but the trial lawyers had been spending money for a long time before that, and they're still spending money on electing judges. So to say that we went from a totally neutral system to a system where uh, there's a bias because firms are spending money is just wrong. Uh, the trial lawyers are, are, have been friendly with the judges. The judges, I don't know, bias, but of course there has been that, that side to the, to the uh, selection of judges, particularly in states like Mississippi and Alabama, where the courts have been, had, had a fairly strong, you could say pro-consumer or pro-plaintiff or anti-business bias but the trial lawyers have always had a role in selecting judges and to say we now have people on both sides, maybe good or bad, but it certainly is something to say. I thought the role of trial lawyers was neglected throughout. One or two people mentioned it, but of course, we always have to keep in mind that all of this money that these people are or are not getting, a third of it goes to the lawyers, and the lawyers have a very strong interest in, um, in, 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 in these issues. And uh, Susan said she raised the money person by person, I would be curious to know who some of those persons um, might have been. But, but the big thing is we're seeing one side. Uh, let me just tell you about a, a paper I wrote with uh, Professor Joanna Shepard of your law school a few years ago, looking at tort reform and looking at it not anecdotally, as this movie does, but looking at tort reform in a systematic manner. And what we found was that overall for the United States from 1980 to 2000, States that passed tort reforms as a result of tort reform had 25,000 fewer deaths. So um, you can look at one side or the other, but we didn't look at anecdotes. We looked at actual death statistics, accidental death statistics, and states with tort reform had, presumably, we, we didn't have the exact mechanism, but we think it's more doctors, more doctors in emergency care, more doctors willing to take risks in states with tort reform. And the result was that tort reforms led to fewer deaths. For example, caps on damages, non-economic damages themselves, in the states that passed them saved 5,000 lives. So uh, to say that you know, the tort reform is, has only these harmful effects, when you look at the whole system, it appears that actually tort reform is beneficial for human health. In terms of arbitration, um, if you're in a bad situation, arbitration is a bad thing. On the other hand, if arbitration reduces the costs of doing business, then wages will be higher, salaries will be higher, costs of credit will be lower because firms are able to save this money in arbitration. Again, you don't see that when you look only at the cases that seem to have gone wrong or when someone actually has a, a case. But if you look at the system overall, if you're saving money, and one reason you're saving money is you're saving that one third of the costs that go to the lawyers. Um, in, in many cases. And of course, one reason why the lawyers don't like arbitration is because damages tend to be lower, which means that the fees that go to the lawyers are also 
lower. So, so I think it, it, it's, it's a very nice piece of propaganda, but as a piece of propaganda, it presents only, only one side. Okay, so I, I want to say that we've invite, we had invited a number of uh, members of the bar in Atlanta who do defense work, and unfortunately their schedules didn't permit them. And, and it seems to me that there's a lot of folks lined up against you, so I want to counsel each one of you uh, to take just a minute or two in, in your remarks. Uh, I want to turn it over to Professor Vandal, but one thing that struck me was uh, the plaintiff in the KBR case actually lost. So, Professor Vandal, um, wouldn't that speak to the notion that uh, corporations are not at risk from this purportedly out-of-control system? They, she lost. I don't know anything about the case, but I would suspect she lost after a fairly expensive trial for Halliburton, so that they're still, even though, even though they won, they, there still was money spent on defending, and that money is money, ultimately, that's going to come out of salaries of workers. Well, uh, Professor Vandal, I'm sure you have some thoughts about this. Well, she lost after probably uh, five years' uh, passage of time. Um, as Susan said, it was in Halliburton. The trial was held in Halliburton's backyard. Uh, lots of evidence uh, couldn't come in. Um, probably the, uh, the drugging, probably some of the men involved uh, weren't there as witnesses. So uh, by the time the trial was held, um, it was probably a, a very uh, difficult case, and I think Susan's point is, is well taken that uh, she wouldn't have gone through all this uh, follow-up anguish uh, uh, if she had in any way uh, consented to uh, the trial. So a trial is an ordeal. Um, I just wanted to make a, a couple uh, uh, follow-up points, and, and that is to make clear what tort reform means, and what it means is uh, to reduce the amount of money that uh, is available for uh, injured uh, victims. That is what we're talking about with tort reform is uh, closing the courthouse doors. Uh, the whole basis for tort reform has been uh, an argued uh, insurance crisis, that is that uh, doctors' insurance was becoming so high that doctors could no longer afford insurance, and so they were leaving states where the insurance had um, uh, become expensive. Uh, Neil Vidmar, uh, uh, an economist from Duke, found that the MedMal damage awards in what were arguably the two worst counties for medical malpractice, the two worst in um, the country that those awards were fair and appropriate, that the docs were not uh, fleeing. Rather, uh, there was a 4% increase per year in uh, doctors coming into the hellhole counties. Um, the fascinating thing that I only learned a couple years ago was that after states dutifully fall in line and the legislators listen to the uh, Chamber of Commerce argument, there is no reduction in insurance rates. So uh, when you hear about the insurance crisis, just remember tort reform is not going to have any impact on that. Um, and I just want to um, suggest that we not merely focus our attention on um, legislation that there are a number of think tanks around the country um, that are generating pro-corporate papers. Uh, there must be a warehouse full of them at this time on, on every view, uh, corporate view that you can imagine. Uh, but the most disturbing thing in my view, in, from my perspective, is the American Law Institute has changed from being a rock solid, uh, reliable organization to churning out uh, pro-corporate uh, uh, material that they label as restatements. And uh, they happen to be in, in the tort area and particularly in the products liability area that I teach in. And I've written several papers on, on these points, but they've uh, changed, argued for a change from strict liability to negligence. Uh, they've argued that um, all prescription drugs uh, should be safe. Uh, that would be a wonderful world if it were true. And just recently, they've argued for a change in cause and fact uh, to get rid of um, the more liberal uh, doctrine 
and to have only the uh, but-for test for cause and fact. What this means is in complicated uh, cases, uh, cases invol involving um, uh, things like Vioxx, pharmaceuticals, where uh, people are ill and they take Vioxx because they're ill and they die, uh, you're going to have a very, very hard time winning those cases because there's no way to show the but-for cause of death. There were a number of causes for that death, and our own uh, uh, legal institution, the American Law Institute, has now uh, uh, gone over to the dark side. You know, <laughs> Justice Brandeis uh, used to say, or had said, that um, uh, sunshine is the greatest disinfectant. And sometimes when I think about our judicial system, I think about it as a portioning right. Somebody wins, somebody loses. But, you know, Adam, Chris, uh, Professor Satz, uh, you have tried cases, you have studied cases. Do you learn things in cases that are a matter of public importance? In other words, does the jury system create this sunshine, this exposure, this transparency that drives regulation and change and creates knowledge that's important for public policy, a public policy dialogue? And, and uh, you know, Adam or Chris or Professor Satz, maybe you can chime in here and respond to that quickly, and we could try to get a dialogue on that. I think the accountability is probably more important. Um, when somebody hears that their insurance company or their credit card company or their bank is charging them $2 extra a month and it's completely fraudulent, their first response is, well, that can't be true. They couldn't get away with that. And the reason that you believe that can't be true and that somebody can't get away with that is because you know they're going to get sued and you know they're going to be held accountable. Um, and that's less a transparency issue, but it's an accountability issue. It's a level the playing field issue with each person who's only suffering $2 or a buck 50 versus a corporation that has billions of dollars. And that's where class actions come into play. And one thing that Susan was referencing about arbitration is, and about the Supreme Court, is that the Supreme Court in the AT&T v. Concepcion case has basically now um, eliminated the ability of um, lawyers and individuals to hold corporations, insurance companies, credit card companies, banks accountable for chipping away at the rights of citizens at a dollar here or two dollars there um, by being able to enforce arbitration agreements for credit card agreements that you never signed um, or for um, uh, cell phone service that you never signed. So, um, you know, the accountability is a big deal and I think that that's what litigation is a big is a big part of it. Adam, do you, do you learn things in litigation that, uh, if surfaced, are a matter of public importance that perhaps if Congress saw, they would, they would uh, impose regulation or begin to think about regulation? Well, absolutely. Um, but I have to say, every case is unique and every case turns on its individual facts. Um, what this all boils down to, to me, in my view, is the one thing that separates the United States of America from the rest of the world, and in my view, is that we have the absolute right to self-govern. And the two places that we do that are at the ballot box and in the jury box. And what tort reform is all about is about, uh, is about money. And it's about fear of you and your neighbors sitting in judgment of them. They would rather select the arbitrators. They would, they would rather uh, legislatively impose uh, caps and other determinative outcome uh, legislative measures in individual cases regardless of the facts. I think, uh, I think Susan was talking about one of the uh, pro-tort reform people said they don't really care what the facts are. I leaned over um, to Professor Vandal and said they, they really don't. That's, and that's what caps are all about. Regardless of whether or not you injure Michael Jordan's hand uh, so that he's totally disabled and unable to use it if it were injured during his prime, or you injure my hand. I mean, surely his hand is worth more than mine is, if you were to compare it. But who's to say that some politician has the right 
after taking campaign contributions from someone to decide that the value of his hand is worth no more than $350,000. That's just wrong. Um, a group of 12 citizens who are impartial and take campaign contributions from no one. In fact, I've told juries this. If anyone were to try and lobby you outside of this courtroom, give you money or influence you in any way, that would be a crime and they would go to jail. And that's because jurors are pure. They're, they're the purest part of our, of our government that makes decisions. You know, I, I, as you're talking, I was thinking back to the Ralph Nader book, Unsafe at Any Speed, back in the 60s, if I recall, and uh, he addressed the issue of, was it the Corvair, Professor Vandal? And uh, the, the Nader strategy was in part to bring lawsuits to expose some of these problems. And what I want to ask you, Professor Rubin, is, is it your contention that that lawsuits don't raise issues of public importance and drive regulation. In other words, isn't, isn't, would you say, for example, that, uh, or, or rule out the possibility that information revealed in lawsuits has not caused Congress to regulate? May or may not have whether the regulation has been good or bad is also another question. There's lots and lots of sources of information in today's world. Um, lawsuits may be one, but again, the data is not there. and and, and the best data I know, I, you know, I hate to keep quoting my own paper, but the data I've, I, I, I've developed with Professor Shepard shows that law, lawsuits as they now exist. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating a world where there's no lawsuits. Uh, tort reform doesn't say there'll be no lawsuits. It says there'll be fewer lawsuits, lower levels of damages, and, but, not, but not no lawsuits. I don't think lawsuits are really uh, the best. I mean, I, I worked for a regulatory, uh, two regulatory agencies uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission and the Federal Trade Commission, and both of them had all sorts of powers for gathering data, subpoena powers, survey powers, CPSC had a, a system of collecting all accident data. So it's not clear to me that you need the tort system for the purpose of generating that data, and it's not clear to me that a system that has the cost of the tort system, again, remember, now you're all lawyers here, so what I think of as a cost uh, the 30% that the lawyers get, you may not think of as a cost, but socially that is a cost, and that's a very expensive way of gathering data. Uh, it, it's also an expensive way of compensating victims. In the movie, the, the parents of the, uh, the child, the boy, said, well, taxpayers are paying through, through Medicaid. Medicaid is a system that has about a 5% cost of running the system. Had, we gotten, had they been paid through the tort system, 30% of, of the money would have gone to the tort lawyers, which to an economist is a transactions cost. I, I, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I, I have to respond to I, I'm sure I, you. I, do. I really do. Okay. Um, so the one thing that you have to understand, which the professor has not disclosed or is not talking about, is when the lawyers don't win. I mean, these lawyers who bring these cases, they, they could spend two, three years out of their lives, $100,000 of their own money, and lose the case, and if they, or more, you know, and, and lose the case, and if they lose the case, they don't make a penny. That's also a social loss. But let me, let me, let me, let me interject something else, and it, I was reminding Paul Zwier, I was driving down the street the other day, and uh, I saw that it cost $10 to park, and, but the no parking zone said there'd be like a $5 parking ticket, so I figured it was cheaper to break the law than to park, park legally. And I guess the question I have is when you start putting, and I pose this to Professor Vandal and Professor Zatz and, and Professor Rubin, and if you start putting caps on damages, will corporations be in the business of calculating the cost of breaking the law and say it's cheaper to break the law than to comply with the law? And if that's the case, what's the impact? Well, I'd, I'd like to uh, respond to, uh, to that. Uh, two questions uh, you've raised, and both can be answered by uh, uh, Ford Motor Company suits. Your first question was, uh, do individual lawsuits have anything to do with broad social policy? Uh, the answer is they do. The uh, plaintiff's attorneys uh, are the canaries in the coal mine. Um, the, there were a couple suits brought in Texas for uh, rollovers. Um, Ford Explorer rollovers. And uh, pretty soon that hit the news, some more suits were brought, and uh, the interview was with the uh, head of NHTSA. And she says, I don't know anything about that. I'll have to look into it. And so uh, she looked into the regs, and the regs did not require Ford Motor Company to tell NHTSA 
that their cars were rolling over when you leaned on them. And so, uh, in fact, Ford said, we don't keep track of that data. Now, I just flat don't believe that. What do they use their computers for? Uh, uh, po poker games? Of, co of course they keep track of how many of their explorers roll over. So what happened was we got safer uh, SUVs uh, because of that. The other uh, uh, problem, of course, is the Ford Pinto, where we had uh, exploding uh, gas tanks. And um, the litigation surrounding the, the Ford Pinto led to uh, safer gas tanks, safer designs in cars. So um, we can uh, thank Ford Motor Company for uh, two big advances in automotive safety. Professor Rubin, do you agree with that? Well, one, one thing I know about Pinto is that as a result of Pinto, companies are, you know, there, was a, there was a paper by uh, Gary uh, Schwartz, I think, the lessons of uh, uh, a, a tort law professor at UCLA, the lessons of Pinto. And one lesson of Pinto was that companies are much we less willing to do safety calculations now because if those safety calculations are discovered as they were in Pinto, juries view them as bad, bad things to do. And so companies are less likely to do safety calculations. If you don't do safety calculations, then you're going to make less safe products because you aren't going to know exactly what products are. As far as rollovers, I actually just finished a paper that had a section on rollovers, and uh, starting with Mercedes, but then other companies privately before NHTSA was involved, before there were lawsuits, private companies had been developing technologies to prevent rollovers for several years, as tends to happen. It started with the expensive cars and was gradually moving down through the system. Uh, by the time NHTSA got involved, uh, most of it had already happened, and NHTSA only was able to, to mandate certain standards because the private companies had adopted them on their own, on their own without any incentive from lawsuits or well, from I, I, regulation. I guess what you're telling me is left to their own devices, companies will act prudently and in the public interest. But as I think about it, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, a lot of the major pharmaceutical companies have either entered pleas or settled claims with the United States government uh, conceding allegations that they engaged in unlawful marketing practices and subjected people to health and safety problems. In fact, no, Pfizer they, did that. They, they, they engaged in unlawful marketing practices, but that doesn't mean they did anything harmful to patients. The unlawful marketing practice, uh, starting about 15 years ago, or when, when uh, Kessler was head of the FDA, the, the rules were changed so that it became illegal to give certain kinds of information to physicians. Uh, even if the information was true, even if it was validated by scientific publications, um, it was, the marketing practice was often providing certain information about unapproved uses to physicians. But unapproved uses has no relation to, to ineffective uses. Well, and, me, and, the, and the cases, so far as I know, never proved, never even alleged ineffectiveness. Often there were cases where there was marketing for condition X this year, three years later, the drug was approved for Condition X, but nonetheless, the cases were brought. Well, Adam's chomping at the bit to respond to this, I think, so let me turn to him. Well, it's not necessarily a response, but uh, so far the conversation is centered around the sale of goods. Um, we're all consumers of both goods and services, and I can give you three quick examples of um, lawsuits that we've handled that I believe resulted in um, changes that were brought to light through the civil um, discovery process as well as the jury trial process that resulted in uh, uh, changes in laws that um, have served us all well, in my view. The first one is a case that was um, filed against a very large HMO in the 1990s after an infant um, suffered quadruple am amputations because the policy and the contract in the HMO required the mom to call the HMO's advice line nurse first before calling 911 and do whatever they say do. Uh, which was, at that time, to drive 42 miles across town to one of their hospitals that they had a contract with when what the child really needed was immediate emergency medical care at a hospital that was only seven miles away. Due to the delay that it took, he lost blood to his extremities and suffered quadruple amputations, still alive today, um, now has uh, graduated from high school and is in college, but has no arms and has no legs. 
The legislature, after that verdict was returned, um, some people even in this room may even remember that verdict, but the Georgia legislature passed a law that made it illegal for HMOs to require their, um, their members to have to call advice line nurses before calling 911. So now you have the right to call 911 and handle your emergency first, contact your HMO later. Um, the second one was we had the privilege of representing Claudia Barnes in her lawsuit brought against the Fulton County Sheriff and nine deputies who permitted um, uh, an inmate to escape and uh, commit some heinous crimes that you all may remember, um, including the murder of um, Superior Court Roland Barnes, uh, Superior Court Judge Roland Barnes. As a result of the discovery in that case um, and what was uh, 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 revealed, um, Fulton County Sheriff's Department wound up changing many of its policies to make sure that what happened in that case can't happen again and tighten security. Um, and finally, uh, recently there was a, a case that we handled involving um, a contract CNRNA that was committing heinous sexual acts on patients at a major um, hospital in the area. Uh, many of you may remember that in the news. But he was permitted to enter the operating rooms with a, with a cell phone and a video camera. As a result of that, convex mirrors are now installed in all operating rooms and um, health care providers have, uh, have, uh, ha have a policy against taking video cameras, uh, private video cameras, into the operating rooms. So without the, without the benefit of the discovery process through the civil justice system and the right to trial by jury, those kinds of things would still be going on. Professor Vandal. Well, I just want to respond to Paul's core thesis. His core thesis, the Chicago economics core thesis, is um, the market. That is, uh, the market works, the law uh, is, a, is a problem and a, and a hassle, and, and uh, all we have to do is stand back and the market will provide. And I think all we have to do is look at the pharmaceutical industry uh, to see that that's not the way it works. The, m the most recent troubling example is Viox. Viox covered up the fact that research on their part had shown that there were troubling issues uh, for certain kinds of uh, patients with, with heart problems. They nevertheless went ahead and marketed this drug and uh, never it started to bubble up. People started to take Vioxx, they started to die, and um, uh, so uh, lawsuits were brought. Nevertheless, to show you the problem with the FDA, you'd think the FDA would say, okay, we're going to stop this. No, the FDA danced with the manufacturers of Vioxx for several years. More people took it. They made, I think, $2 billion during that period. Uh, people died. And so uh, in, in certain situations, the market does not provide optimal safety. Instead, you need uh, courageous personal injury attorneys who will uh, uh, risk uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in bringing these cases. Well, one thing about corporations is there's lots of them. So uh, if you don't like what one of them's doing, you can usually find another one. There's only one government. So if you don't like what the government's doing, there's not much you can do about it. Uh, so if you believe in any sort of competition, then there's, there's to, to me, there's a real advantage of privatizing what you can privatize <laughs> because there, there's competition there. If, uh, if, if you don't like arbitration clauses, if enough people don't like arbitration clauses, then someone will go into business and say, we don't have arbitration clauses. This is something you don't have to worry about. On the other hand, that firm will probably pay lower wages because arbitration clauses save money. If the government says there can't be any arbitration clauses, then we're done. There won't be any at all, and there's no room for competition. So um, I don't know that I would go as far as Frank and say the market always works, although I will say that it's my understanding there are many people suffering from arthritis who wish they had the right to take Vioxx, even given the risks, because they found the drug worthwhile with the risk. But aside from that, uh, you know, I just like a world where there's more choices rather than fewer choices. When the government does it, there's no choice. One question from me and as my prerogative, and then I want to take a few from the audience and uh, we'll, we'll re resume uh, uh, under co with cocktails. Um, 
you know, I live in Washington, and we all knew that in February the budget debate was over about $30 billion. We almost shut down the government over $30 billion, and then we get to the beginning of the summer, and it's about $400 billion. And Professor Satz brought up the question of health care. And prescription drugs are a huge component of our health care costs. In fact, it's about competition. How do we compete with the Chinese when we have large health care costs? And you said that these cases that I asked you about, Pfizer and uh, AstraZeneca were really about just off-label marketing, which is marketing outside the indication. But if these companies are engaged in these off-label marketing activities, I suspect they would be costing the Medicare and Medicaid system significant dollars. And isn't there a value in exposing these practices through you know, private litigation, where the companies engage in such legal conduct that not only affects patient treatment, but may impact actual costs to the government at a time when we don't have much money. Actually, drugs tend to save money. In many cases, drugs are cheaper than the alternatives, and newer drugs, which are more expensive, are more effective and save more money than older drugs. Uh, the first example were some of the ulcer drugs, which all of a sudden you didn't have to have surgery for an ulcer. You could take a drug, but uh, for many heart conditions, you can take drugs instead of surgery. The, the best evidence is that drugs save money and that um, newer drugs, as I say, the, the ones that are the ones that people market, and we don't market old drugs because they're off patent, newer drugs save more money than old drugs. So in those cases you're giving, again, I, I worked on one of those cases and no one cared about whether the drug was beneficial or not. The only issue was whether there was off-label marketing, um, but the evidence that I saw said the drug probably was Actually, I'll just, was I'll just say that the settlement agreement with the United States government in the Pfizer case focusing on the drug Geodon said that the drug was off-label marketed to, to, chill, to a pediatric population and the company made misrepresentations about the safety and efficacy of the drug. So these cases not only raise issues about marketing outside the indication, but they raise issues about misbranding where you're making misrepresentations about the safety but and efficacy. Some may. The ones I've seen have been just off-label. Okay. And Ruben, if I could just say, I want to address just a safety issue. Um, you know, Professor Ruben, I, I believe, indicated that one of the, uh, actually, the lesson to be learned from Pinto is that you shouldn't do safety tests. Um, I respectfully disagree with that. I think the lesson to be learned from Pinto is that you don't design cars that are unsafe that catch fire on rear end collisions. But, but and I believe that the litigation process and trial attorneys brought that issue to the forefront faster than any other mechanism, and that because of that, it saved lives. Well, I, first of all, I want to thank Professor Rubin for putting up with us, and you've, you've been a good sport. And, 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 and these, are, these are complicated issues, and I'm not, you know, obviously it's pretty clear that I have a perspective on this, we all have perspectives on this, but I, I do appreciate him being here and drawing this, this debate out. If, we'll take one or two questions. Um, anybody, if anybody has one or two questions, yes. Read, it was published. Uh, okay. Uh, so shoot has really been the case that's certainly bothered me the most. I've talked to some other students and has bothered them. Um, and it seems to be a case where the Supreme Court really said to uh, Carnival Cruise Lines, this arbitration clause is savvy business and we applaud you for it. And uh, so really I have two questions and the first one is specifically to Professor Rubin who I very much applaud again for standing in the face of much uh, <laughs> uh, Opposite, many opposite opinions around him, but uh, wh what is the positive evidence that shows that money that is saved from litigation costs is actually redistributed in positive ways like lower fares, higher wages? And then to the rest of the panel, uh, more so, um, what, are, what in your opinions are either the best legal reasons for or against sustaining arbitrations? Economic concerns aside, what about contracts or their nature or torts uh, shows the best reasons that either arbitration should be supported or repealed. I haven't, I haven't seen the evidence you're asking for. Uh, what we do know, or at least what I believe, is that arbitration is less expensive than litigation. And if it is less expensive, then economic theory is very clear that at some point 
it's going to lead to lower prices. Not, not because firms want to do it, but because if their costs go down, their profit maximizing price will also go down. Um, and so, so if, if, if arbitration is less expensive, then there's just no way that it's not going to ultimately affect consumer prices. Uh, so, but, so the answer is I don't, there may be some evidence, but I, I don't know that evidence. We'll take one more question. There's one. Um, one thing that I think is important to mention is that um, the constitutional right to a jury system is preserved in the Seventh Amendment and it's been slowly under attack. And in 2005, there was legislation passed in Georgia uh, which capped damages, non-economic damages one could receive as a result of a medical error. And recently, in 2010, that was overturned in the Nesselhut decision. I just wanted to ask Adam if you could briefly comment about that. Um, Adam's role was really instrumental in overturning those caps. Well, I had the privilege of representing Betty Nestle Hud and trying her case before um, a jury in Fulton County. Um, I also had the privilege of working with um, uh, Michael Terry and Darren Somerville of the Bondurant firm um, on the appeal to the Supreme Court. So as much as I'd like to take full credit for um, the result, um, I think first Betty Nestle Hutt deserves most of it. And then, I, of course, I have to share it with those lawyers that helped and, and, and many, many who came long before I did. Um, in bringing these issues to the forefront. But um, Julie is absolutely right. Um, in the federal constitution, you have a Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial in any, in any matter uh, or controversy uh, involving more than $20. Um, the Nestle Hut decision turned on our state constitution, however, where in our state constitution, um, it says that the right to trial by jury shall remain inviolate. Uh, we challenged uh, the caps on that basis that it violated that provision of the Georgia Constitution as well as separation of powers and the equal protection of the laws. However, the unanimous Georgia Supreme Court, um, who by the way have uh, had two justices um, who joined in the unanimous decision that were appointed by the governor who signed the bill, um, so uh, which if we had time I'd really like to comment on our, the importance of the independence of our judiciary because that's, that's paramount to all of this. But um, in answering your question, um, the court hung its hat on the constitutional right to uh, uh, trial by jury in Georgia and that it shall remain inviolate. And then when the legislature steps in and predetermines what a fact and issue is, and damages are, actual damages are a fact and issue. Actual damages, as you've learned in torts, include economic damages as well as non-economic damages. Punitive damages is a completely separate issue, which is not really a fact, and there, is case, there are plenty of cases that say so. That is, a, uh, that is a punishment that is assigned by a jury based on conduct, but it's not a fact and issue. So uh, what the Constitution says is, and the Supreme Court confirmed that the Constitution says, is that the jury has the right to determine all the facts, both liability, causation, uh, and damages. And so, uh, by passing a law which uh, legislatively predetermined the maximum amount of money that anyone could recover in a medical malpractice case, um, the legislature had stepped in and violated the jury's right to determine those, uh, to determine that issue. Well, you know, all of you are sitting out there and thinking about how I can affect the system. Most importantly, you're figuring out who's going to pay me, how I'm going to be employed, what law firm's going to hire me. and. Uh, Susan was kind enough to come here from the West Coast, and she is a living example of how you can go and do it yourself and make a difference. And um, I'm not here to educate you. I think we're here to sort of look at you as the next generation that's going to have to solve these problems. In 10 years or 15 years down the road, I may look across the courtroom and see you, or you may be colleagues, and I look for you for your thought and your inspiration. With that said, I will turn it over to Susan for the final word, who was kind enough to come all the way from the West Coast and took it upon herself to, to uh, expose or deal with uh, an issue of importance to her. Thank you so much, Ruben. And I'm so grateful to this panel and to the school for um, allowing me to share um, my film with you. Um, I do just want to defend myself for just one minute um, about this whole issue of my film being a piece of propaganda. Um, I'm not exactly sure um, how you define that term, Professor, but um, just so you know, I haven't made any money yet on this film at all. It took two and a half years out of my practice. I haven't practiced law in two and a half years. I didn't make this for anyone except you. 
You know, I didn't make this film for anyone except the, the public who are giving away their civil rights and their constitutional rights. And, you know, I, I represented injured people for 25 years, and yeah, I have a point of view, and I knew that the people that I represented were not getting a fair shake, and that the civil justice system wasn't fair anymore to average folks. And I just wanted that information out there to the public. And so I don't know, um, you know, we all come from our own points of view. You know, we all come, I'm, in this, I'm here in this moment from everything that's happened to me up to this moment. And yes, I've had personal experiences. I don't know what everybody's experiences are that brings you to whatever opinions you have in this moment. But I speak from my truth, from my heart, and this movie is my truth as I've lived it. And no one has influenced me in making this film. I didn't get money from any trial lawyer group. I didn't make this for any trial lawyers to make money or anything about money. This is about getting the truth out to the public. So if you call that propaganda, then that's a different definition than mine. Um, so I just want to thank you, and I hope that if I can influence in any way or open your minds in any way to another point of view that you can be more educated when these issues come up, that when you vote in the next election that you're actually voting with more information when you sit in a jury box or when you talk to people who sit in jury boxes, that they're sitting in jury boxes giving unbiased uh, opinions and being fair and coming in with a fair slate for the people who are in front of them, both the plaintiff and the defendant. Well, th the panel, thank you for Adam, Chris, and Professor Rubin, who's a member, already a member of the Armia community, but at least across the street you are now officially, and Susan, of course, part of the Advocacy Center community. Thank and I hope that you will continue to be a resource to the folks here through emails, through dialogue. And I hope this, this discussion uh, doesn't end with, with this uh, debate or panel. And I invite you all to a reception outside. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.